Hello Internet, how's it going? Thanks for tuning in and welcome to episode number three of Jan's Petrol Corner, in which I talk about how to get a synthesizer to make the sounds that you hear in your head. I'm Jan Morgenstern from Treesoft Audio and it's been a hot minute, right? Um, I put the second episode out in what I think was still the last couple of days of 2022 and I was not planning on leaving you all waiting for this long. I ran into a little bit of a case of best laid plans. I spent the winter months with my partner in Canada and I was kind of hoping that I'd be able to you know, cobble together a new episode from there. But the logistics of that made that kind of never really pan out. And then I got a visit from the COVID ferry. So that was medium fun. But now I'm back in action and ready to finally tackle this new episode, which will have us wrapping up our recreation of my patch Bioluminescence from my library Zebra Elementals Isla. And that one you can get as always and along with all my other stuff from treeswiftaudio.com. And if you use offer code QUILTMASTER, it'll give you 10% off. So, in this episode, we're gonna tackle the third and final layer of this patch, which is in principle another background layer, but also kind of the one that gives this patch its unique voice in the first place. And I mentioned in the last episode that this layer is a little bit more complex than the other ones, at least on the modulation side. Still no rocket science in there, but you know, there can be a couple head scratchers uh, depending on how familiar you are with the ins and outs of Zebra's modulation system. And on that note, I just wanted to give you a quick heads up before we start, um, because um, you know that it's kind of important to me and I keep making the point that this is supposed to be a series on sound design and not on sound design using Yuhi Zebra 2, even if that happens to be what I'm using. So uh, in general, I'm trying to make sure that the stuff that I'm explaining will be just as useful to you, even if you happen to be using a different synth. That said, there's gonna be a couple of spots in this episode where I might have to walk back a little bit on that promise and go into a bit more detail on how to specifically, you know, make Zebra do your bidding because just some of the stuff that's happening on this layer requires some, let's call it negotiation <laughs> with the sometimes unique ways in which Zebra handles things internally. But that being said, there's also gonna be still a whole lot of information that will be universally applicable. And I'm also gonna talk a little bit about the approach that I'm taking um, with, with planning and laying out a more complex component of a sound like this. So I'd like to think that it's still gonna be worth your while to keep watching, even if you're not a Zebra user yourself. Okay, with that out of the way, I think we're about ready to dive in. So without further ado, here's Bioluminescence part 303. Enjoy. All right, so since it's been a while, let's start once again with a quick recap on uh, what we've got in the can so far. So this is our patch in its current state. We've got this nice, smooth, warm, kind of analog sounding synth pad that is now happening on two layers, although they're both feeding from the same sound source, which is an oscillator or technically a stack of slightly detuned oscillators that are putting out kind of a sawtooth adjacent spectrum. And on our first layer, which is kind of the basis of our sound, we're putting that signal through a standard low pass filter, with a little bit of envelope modulation. And on the second layer uh, that, we, that we made in the last episode, we are using a bandpass filter to carve out um, a region in the upper mids of the spectrum and use the, the kind of the dense cluster of overtones that we're getting from that and, and put that through a frequency shifter that turns it into this kind of pleasant swirly wash in the background. I have some manual control over the brightness of my filter and the whole thing also responds to the velocity of what I'm playing. And in this stage, this is a perfectly usable and potentially useful patch. If anything, I would say that it's still a little bit on the vanilla side. You know, I would kind of take a guess that most of you have dozens, if, if not hundreds of sounds that are fairly similar to this in your libraries already. So in the third layer that we're gonna look into in this episode, we're gonna try and give this patch more of a distinct 
personality and more of a unique voice that will hopefully make it stand out a little bit more from other sounds. And I'm not going to pull up and play my original patch that we've modeled this one after at this point. If you're interested in that, you can always check back on, on the first episode. Um, I haven't listened to it myself in a good long while, and I kind of think that it's going to be more interesting if we take the idea and the intent behind behind that third layer and run with that and see where it gets us instead of you know listening to to the original and then trying to kind of ape that sound. And that kind of ties into a larger point that I wanted to make because I kind of wanted to, to talk a little bit about the approach that I'm trying to take when it comes to creating sounds or, or parts of sounds that I know will be a little bit more involved conceptually. So up to this point, we've been taking more or less an iterative approach with this patch, right? Which is to say that we've started from a... Um, from the point of a very simple, very basic setup, just a single sawtooth oscillator and a low-pass filter. And then what got us to this point was a long series of relatively minor tweaks, each of which got us a little bit closer to the actual sound that we had in mind, right? And that's a perfectly valid and, and useful approach. Whenever you're doing anything that doesn't have too many moving parts that depend on, on one another. But in my experience, it's also an approach that can only get you so far. Because sooner or later, you're going to want to do something that will require multiple components, multiple modules playing together in a way where, where there's like very little wiggle room for, for getting it, it right or, or wrong. You either get those components to play together perfectly to get the, get the result that you want or you're just not going to get the result that you want. Like, not at all. Not even in the ballpark. And in those cases, it can get frustrating if you're trying to start from a simpler setup and then kind of try to inch your way towards the more complex one and then keep trying stuff and hope that something will get you closer to it. And it kind of makes more sense to go into the process with some kind of roadmap in hand that can kind of help you not lose sight of your ultimate end goal and, and kind of guide you through the process. And what that roadmap can look like for you and whether it's in your head or on paper or, I don't know, in a spreadsheet, uh, of course, that's entirely up to you. Um, do whatever works for you. I'm going to tell you what works for me and how I got to that point. So I have a background in programming before I was foolish enough to go into music. I spent a couple of years working as a software developer. And when you're creating a piece of software, whether it's an entire application or a subsystem or a library, it's considered good practice to start by sitting down and coming up with, with a sort of outline or a description of what it is exactly that you want or, or that you expect your final product to be and what you expect it to do and how you expect it to behave. And you do that before you even write a single line of code. Ideally, you do that before you even start thinking about code because that's kind of the crucial point that makes that whole approach work. Kind of the golden rule here is you do not think about implementation yet. You resist any urge that you might have to think about the stuff that you're putting down in terms of okay, how are we going to do that? Maybe you're not even thinking about, hey, can we even do that? And instead, you kind of really, really limit yourself to describing what you want your final product to be from the outside, from a perspective of one of your end users or, or a different developer that, uh, that's using your code. And, and really treat it as a black box that you throw some kind of input against and will get some kind of output from. And I find it really, really useful to try and emulate that approach in sound design. Um, I, I'm not going to lie and, and pretend that this is how I design all my sounds because, let's be honest, this stuff takes enough time as it is. But what I can say is that whenever I do stick to that approach, it usually works out in my favor and it consistently gets me to 
to places and gives me results that I don't think I could have gotten to easily in any other way. Because on a base level, I think it's, it's just good practice to kind of force me to really pin down what it is that I want a component of a sound to do before I get my hands dirty on the modules. But I think for me, the, the real magic really lies in that, in that golden rule, do not think about implementation. Because that kind of has a way of turning the entire process into this kind of creative challenge that I've really come to appreciate. Because the thing is, if I'm thinking about a new sound that I want to make in terms of, okay, let's say I'm going to take a pulse oscillator and then I'm going to modulate the pulse width with, with a triangle LFO and then put that through a low-pass filter with an envelope. What I'm doing there is I'm repeating myself, right? I'm, I'm pulling from my internalized cookbook of synth recipes that I've tried in the past and that I know will get me some kind of useful result or at least have a good idea of what I can expect from, right? And there's nothing inherently wrong with that. We all do that in our creative endeavors because it's just the, the, the shortest path to, you know, getting useful results. But I, I've also realized that there's always, at least for me, that there's always a, a danger of becoming too, too complacent about that, that process and kind of, thinking of it as as the default it's just just the way you do things right and and it, that it's very easy to forget that what i what's happening when i think of a new sound in terms of signal flow and module parameters and modulations first is i'm setting myself up to walk down a path that i've walked down before and that by nature, closes off any paths that you know I haven't been on before. Maybe because I they didn't even occur to me. Where I, whereas if if I'm coming at it from the opposite angle, and I'm thinking of a new sound in terms of, okay, I want this to sound like a thousand glass windows all shattering at once, or a pipe organ where instead of pipes I have human whistlers, <laughs> or articulated alien language, or a realistic acoustic drum set. Well, first of all, I'm setting myself up for failure, right? Because <laughs> chances are that whatever synth I'm, I'm working on won't let me get to that exact point and, and won't let me get that exact sound that I'm hearing in my head when I'm thinking about stuff like that. But I also find that I consistently fail on a level <laughs> that is so much more interesting than anything I could have achieved if I, if I had stuck to stringing together tried and proven synth recipes. Because on the way of trying to get to that point, unattainable as it may be ultimately, I'm constantly rubbing, rubbing up against the synth's limitations and, and its quirks and its idiosyncrasies that are all trying to keep me from getting to that exact point right and that kind of creates this constant creative friction and kind of keeps me on my toes and kind of forces me to to constantly come up with compromises and and with uh, creative workarounds to at least get a little bit closer to to the sound that i'm hearing in my head and those workarounds more often than not um, turn out to be stuff that I could not have come, out, come up with in a hundred years in any other way, just because there, there would, would have been no need to come up with them. And a lot of times they get me to sonic results that I might not have thought possible coming from my synth. And many times those workarounds then turn out to be so useful that they then become new parts of my vernacular and, and kind, of, kind of become new synth recipes in their own rights that I can add to my cookbook and, and make it much easier to get, to get to these results in the future. So I guess what I'm saying is if you're anything like me and you might be prone to thinking about 
a sound that you want to get out of his, of, a, of a synthesizer in, in terms of, okay, what sounds can this synth make? What sounds have I made in the past with a synth? Then just give it a try and, and try, to, try to pull yourself out of that mindset for a minute and try to forget everything that you think you know about that synth, maybe about synthesis. And really come up with like an almost naive like a kind of starry-eyed and, and pie-in-the-sky description of what you would like your result to be in an optimal scenario. If you were not hindered at all by the limitations of synths, and then start getting your hands dirty and see how close you can come to that, right? So, yeah. <laughs> thanks for coming to my TED Talk. I'm Jan Morgenstern. Um, let's, let's make this a little bit less abstract and see whether we can put this approach to work for us in, in our case. So my starry-eyed pie-in-the-sky idea about the third layer of this patch was this. What if I had a bunch of players that were spread across a room and each player had a mark tree in their hand? You know, those those rows of like little tiny uh, metal wind chimes that you do glissandos on when the fairies come into frame. Um, so each of them had a mark tree and a stick. And I told my players, okay, don't even listen to what the others are doing. Just at your discretion, in, at, at irregular intervals, give one of your chimes a little hit. Like carefully so that it doesn't touch its neighbors. And then wait Two seconds, five seconds, ten seconds, whatever you feel like. And then repeat and hit a different chime. So that when everything comes together, um, we're hopefully getting this kind of unpredictable, sparkling cloud of little metallic dings that are coming from somewhere in the room. All right. So if I was looking for this texture for a music production, or if I was making a sample library, say... Um, I would be done at this point, right? And I could start phoning up my friends, and telling them, hey, Thursday night, my place, there's going to be beer, bring your mark tree. But since we're making a synth patch, in order for that to be useful to us, we're going to have to translate it into um, somewhat more technical terms. And I'm still not talking about anything that would be specific to the synth that we're using. I just kind of want to put this scenario under a microscope and work out what are the most important sonic properties that define the sound that we would be getting out of this setup. So that ideally um, it would kind of yield some kind of you know, list of, of tangible technical requirements or, or targets that we can then hit and, and that we can then use as a, as a kind of checklist as we go through the design of this of this layer. Okay, let's try that. Um, so what's happening? First of all, I want the sound to consist of multiple independent layers of continuously repeating discrete audio events. Discrete in this context just meaning that each event happens on its own in isolation and there's no interaction between them. I want each of these events to be kind of percussive in nature, meaning that it should follow the natural progression of like a metal object that you strike with, a, with another object. So in other words, I, I want a clearly defined attack at the beginning that lasts like a couple milliseconds that is fairly, fairly rich in, in brightness and in brilliance and in level, but then also very quickly tapers off into a much longer, but also much more subdued and much less brilliant decay phase as the, as the, the, the object rings out. I want these events to be tonal. This is where I'm taking a little bit of, a, of an artistic license because um, those wind chimes are kind of kind of in the middle between a harmonic and an inharmonic spectrum. I guess I want them more on the harmonic side so that we can make out, you know, definite pitches. I want these pitches to be randomized from one audio event. Let's not call them audio events. Let's call them dings from now on. 
Um, so from one ding to the next, I want these pitches to be randomized, which doesn't necessarily mean that I want them to be entirely random, but I want there to be some element of chance, some element of, of randomness to, to the pitches that we're getting. I also want them to be random in timing, meaning I don't want these dings to occur at regular intervals, but you know, at, at random points in time with you know, random pauses in between, maybe with random envelope times. And I also want the position, like the, the location on the stereo stage to be randomized from one thing to the next, because we are trying to model a room full of players after all. Okay. Um, Talking about the sound, I want the entire thing to take place in the upper regions of the audible spectrum, or at least in the upper regions of, of you know, the part of the spectrum where we can identify pitches. That one's kind of self-explanatory because, I mean, you know what wind chimes sound like. They're kind of in triangle territory. And it also makes sense when we look at what's going on in our patch so far, because that is a region of the spectrum where there's nothing or not much going on in our patch so far, which, which means that we, we won't have to compete with any elements that are already in place. I do not want this new sound to add a significant amount of energy and loudness to our sound. That was a requirement that I also had for the, for the second layer already. I'm perfectly happy with the energy and the loudness and the presence that we're getting from our main, our first layer. And I, I don't really want to add any new elements that are kind of blowing that up and make it, you know, occupy more space in a mix and, and in the spectrum. So in other words, whatever ends up happening on our new, new layer should also kind of be in the background and just provide, you know, more texture and more more motion without actually adding to the energy of the patch. And finally, and, and this is kind of the only point or the only item on our list that doesn't um, directly and, and logically kind of derive from my little wind chime scenario, it's just a personal preference. I do not want this sound to mess with the tonal purity of our patch. And what I mean by that is in its current state, uh, our, our patch has a very strong tonality to it, meaning that if I play a middle C, there's no mistaking it for anything else. We're getting a very conservative spectrum where both the lowest and the strongest component is our fundamental frequency. And then anything that happens above that in the spectrum comes directly from the natural harmonic overtone series of C. And that also means that when I play a pure, let's say, C major triad, we're getting a very, very pure sound. There's no harmonic friction of any kind in that sound. There's no, no hint of any notes that don't belong into that triad and, and no hints of like any additional tension or, or, extension, or chord extensions. And I like that about our patch. I think that's, that's very much in line with its intent that it has this kind of innocent and pure sound and I don't want whatever's happening in our new layer to interfere with that. So, hey, look at that. We got ourselves a list. We have a list of hard, verifiable technical requirements or targets that we know that we'll have to hit and that we can test our stuff against. So all that's left at this point is, you know, coming up with something that will let us put check marks after each of these items, which pff, basically done here, right? Which is why I'm going to leave the rest as an exercise to you. I'm kidding. Okay, um, where do we start? So the first and only item on this list that we won't have to lose any sleep over is the multiple layers part. Obviously, my original pitch for this for this layer calls for multiple players in the room because I want that overlap between what, what different players are doing. 
just so that we're getting a denser and, and more complex and interesting texture overall. But the thing is that um, Zebra will give that to us for free because we are making a synth pad and people are generally not playing pad sounds in single notes, but you know, in intervals and chords. And what that means for us is that there's a fairly high chance that we will have multiple notes sounding at any given moment. And even if we stick to only implementing a single layer on a note, it will still get duplicated and replicated for the other voices that are sounding. So as long as we make sure that the layers on these voices will be sufficiently distinct and sufficiently different from one another so that the end result reads as multiple layers, we should be golden. So let's tentatively say that we've got that one in the bag without having done anything. But for the rest of this list, we're going to have to get our hands dirty. No way around it. So let's start by figuring out where we'll get our basic sound from. Item three on the list says that we want the sound to be tonal, which tells me that there's probably going to be some kind of oscillator involved. It's not going to be, you know, like a pure noise affair or anything. Item eight says that we don't want the sound to have a lot of energy, which aside from like level and mixing um, considerations um, translates to me first and foremost into something that doesn't occupy a lot of space in our frequency spectrum and hence the mix. Or in other words, a sound that doesn't have a lot of harmonic content or overtones. So why not go all the way with that? and start with a one waveform that has zero harmonic content, which of course is a sine wave. So you can easily coax a sine wave out of zebra standard oscillators, no problem. It's just a little bit below their pay grade. You know, there's, there's, there would be a lot of cool functionality that we would be leaving on the table. And, you know, since in the trenches, you never know when you might need one of Zebra's full-featured oscillators. A more economical choice would be to go with one of the FM operators instead, which, as long as we're not doing any actual FMing, are functionally just sine wave generators. Okay, so at this point, I'm going to mute our existing layers and also switch our effects chain into bypass so that we can hear the output from our new layer raw and unprocessed. Just going to turn that down a little bit. Okay, so there's our sine wave. Um, item seven on the list says that I want the tonal base for this new layer to be in a much higher range than this. So for now, I'm just going to add two octaves to the pitch of this oscillator. Put it like 24 semitones above our actual pitch. Cool. So now that we've got a basic sound going, let's start looking into randomization. Obviously, randomization is kind of at the core of everything that we're trying to do here. So we'll have to start looking into how Zebra handles random stuff internally. And the first thing that we'll have to be aware of is that the only source in Zebra that can give us a continuous stream of randomized modulation over the course of a note or while a note is sounding are the LFOs. If all we need is a single random-ish value for, for a note, um, or if we can re-trigger, for instance, if we're using the arpeggiator, we can kind of fake our way around that, but that's not the case here. We'll have to be prepared for somebody, you know, playing a single note for two minutes, and over the entirety of those two minutes, we'll have to, we'll have to keep, you know, keep the random values coming. And the only thing that can give us that is an LFO in one of its two random modes. Okay, so... I already know that I want our, our pitches to be randomized, so I'm just gonna go ahead and set up a new modulation on the tune parameter of our new oscillator, and I'm gonna assign a new LFO to that. Um, you might be noticing that I'm skipping LFO2. That's gonna make sense later. Okay, so real quick. Um, Zebra's LFOs have two different random modes, random hold and random glide. Random hold gives us a new um, a new random value between minus one and one at regular intervals, 
every n milliseconds depending on where we set the rate or the speed of the LFO. And then it keeps that value constant until the next one comes along so that we're getting this kind of stepped, uh, the, these random steps. So an easy way to visualize how that thing works is it, it kind of does the same thing as a square wave LFO, just that instead of a one, one high and one low value, you're getting two entirely random values within one cycle. Um, random Glide does exactly the same thing. It also generates these equidistant uh, random values in the background. It just also connects between them via linear interpolation. In other words, it's, it's connecting these random dots with lines so that we're getting this constant motion as we go from one random value to the next. But in our case, since we know that we want, want to keep our random value constant over the course of a ding, it's clear that we will have to go with random hold for that. All right, so we got our pitch modulation in place. We have our you know, source of uncertainty ready and waiting. Actually, let me put this to an absolute time scale that isn't related to our song tempo. So I can crank up our modulation def and check it out. should have sent a poet okay so it's random <laughs> so that's good i guess but obviously if nothing else this is stepping hard on requirement number nine on our list which says don't mess with our tonality and of course this is kind of setting fire to our tonality and of course it is because the pitches that we're generating in this way are you know have no rhyme or reason to to them they are not even coming from a from a musical scale of any sort, let alone have anything to do with what I'm actually playing. So they're kind of turning our sound into this atonal train wreck. And in order to fix that, uh, we're going to have to figure out how to keep that element of randomness in place, but also make sure that the, the actual pitches that we're getting out of that will come from a limited set or a limited pool of allowable pitches that we can then handpick to only contain those pitches that we know won't clash with what we're playing, with our bass pitches, right? And mathematically, the way that I can do that is um, I want to take the original random values that we're getting out of LFO3 and round each one, each of these values, to the respective nearest allowable pitch in our list, whatever that will end up looking like, right? In other words, I want to quantize it. I want to take a functionally continuous signal that doesn't have any steps to it and kind of push it into my own raster and, and kind of make sure that all the values that, that we're getting come from, you know, like a, a limited number of stepped values. And the canonical way to quantize a modulation signal in Zebra is by redirecting it through an MMAP table. And I've, um, I've introduced those in the last episode. Um, we already have one in place here that, that we're using to reshape our linear mod wheel signal into something that's more convex. Um, so just, just as a quick recap, the MMAP tables let you take any existing uh, modulation source in Zebra and for any possible value that you can get out of that source define a new output value that you want to use instead. So in the case of this one that uses the mod wheel as its input you can see as I'm moving my mod wheel it's using that as a kind of position indicator that will determine which of these bars that we can you know, freely modify will generate the actual output signal that we're using or the output value. And the way that we can use that to quantize the signal is simply by making sure that our table will only contain values that are coming from our list of allowable values so that we can be sure that no matter what our original source is generating, it will always be converted, you know, rounded, quantized, whatever you want to call it, into one of the step values that we actually want. Okay, so we got a plan. 
Um, instead of using LFO3 directly for our pitch modulation, I'm going to use a new MMAP table and I will set LFO3 to be the input source for that table and put it into the map quantize mode. So the only a difference between map quantize and map smooth is that map smooth will give you interpolated values um, for any input value that would land us in between two bars, which of course we don't want in this case. Cool. So um, if you're looking closely, I guess if you're if you're watching in HD, you might be able to make out that the random values that we're getting from LFO3 are becoming visible here and are lighting up the bars in various positions of our table. Okay, so the remaining two questions that we'll have to figure out in order to get this to work are what are the pitches that we want to allow our dings to have? And then how do we get those into our table, right? And by the way, just for the record, whenever I talk about pitches in this context, I'm referring to relative pitches, of course, i.e. intervals in relation to our input nodes or our base pitches. I hope that's clear. So as to what pitches we want to allow, there's a couple different philosophies or approaches to figuring that out, mostly depending on your personal thresholds for what you consider an acceptable level of harmonic friction in your sound and also whether you're regarding the pitches that you're dealing with as additional musical notes in their own right or whether you're treating them as say overtones like parts of the of the harmonic spectrums of whatever is happening below in this case we don't really have to worry about those details too much because we're going to go with the single most basic and safest approach to this, which is we're going to stick to the octaves above our bass pitch. Safest because any octave above a fundamental frequency is guaranteed to be in the natural harmonic overtone series of that pitch. Um, so we know that we won't have any spectral collisions or clashes. But also if you're thinking about that um, purely in terms of notes when i play let's say my pure c major triad if i'm adding nothing but c's and e's and g's in the octaves above it will never turn into anything but a pure c major triad so let's say that we want to give our random generator a range of four octaves to choose from with the lowest possible octave being two octaves above our bass pitch, which is what I set the tune parameter of our oscillator to. So how do we get our MAP table to do that for us? Well, we already know that we want to quantize the entire range of values that we're getting from LFO3 down to only four discrete values, right? One for each octave. So instead of the usual 128 slots that the MAP table is giving me, I can set that down to four bars that are then, you know, stretched across the entirety of the input range. So what are the values that we need to put in here? Um, each bar can have a value range somewhere in between minus 100 and 100. I find it most intuitive to think of those values as percentages or, you know, as the actual range that we're getting to to go from minus one to one because like with any other modulation that takes place in zebra only looking at the value that comes out of your modulation source doesn't yet tell you anything about the actual result of that modulation unless you also take into account the modulation depth that you set the whole thing to or more specifically if we want to figure out the absolute magnitude of a modulation in whatever units the modulated parameter is using, we'll have to multiply the, uh, the value that we're getting from our modulation source with our modulation depth. Example, if I leave this, if I leave our mod depth um, set to 12 semitones, which is an octave, and our MAP table comes across a bar that I've set to 100 and puts that val value out, we will be adding exactly an octave to our tune parameter. If I set that bar to minus 100, we will go 
down an octave. If I set it to zero, nothing will happen because, you know, obviously there's no modulation taking place. If I set it to 50, it will give us a lovely tritone because that that's half an octave. So depending on what you're trying to do, figuring out that exact relationship and, you know, working out what will be the perfect you know, scaling of your modulation depth that will give you, you know, access to all the the values that, that you want to hit can get pretty finicky. But in this case, it's, it's going to be relatively straightforward. So if we want to make a range of, you know, multiple octaves addressable to us, one way to achieve that would be to set our modulation depth to 48 semitones, which is four octaves. And now when I put a bar at a value of 50%, it will give us um, half that range, which is two octaves up. If I set it to 75%, it will get us three octaves up. If I put it to 25, it will add one octave. And if I leave the first bar at zero, then it means when we hit that, then you know there's no modulation and we will stay on our original tuning of two octaves up from bass pitch. And that sounds like that. Which still might not be altogether pleasant, but, you know, um, seeing that we're coming from whatever this was. I would hope that you agree that that's, that's an improvement. And it let us put a couple more check marks on our list, which is great. So we're, we're making some progress. So the next largest thing from our list that is still missing from our layer is that it's still not giving us a sense of listening to separate audio events, right? Or in other words, there's still no trace of the dings that we're looking for. All we got at this point is a constant tone that is skipping between pitches. And in order to turn that into something that will read to our listeners as a series of repeating percussive tonal events, we will have to at the very least figure out a way to give some kind of shape to its volume over time. Or in other words, come up with a volume envelope. And since we're looking for repeating events, we will need that envelope to repeat itself or loop for the same reasons that we need our, our random values to keep coming over the course of a held note because we cannot rely on that note being re-triggered in order to restart things. What makes this a little bit tricky is that this loop needs to occur in perfect lockstep with our random LFO. Those two things need to be synchronized to one another and stay in sync. And that is because in addition to giving shape to our volume, we will also need our envelope to conceal the moments where we're skipping from one pitch to the next, because we want to make sure that these moments will always and reliably occur outside of our envelope or in a region of the envelope where we are not hearing them because if we don't do that and those skips will land in the middle of our envelope well they they will stick out like sore thumbs and ruin our illusion because you know metal chimes are not known for abruptly changing their pitch in the middle of ringing out so hey zebra has envelope generators out the wazoo right we have these more traditional ADSR-ish generators, and we also have our fancy programmable multi-segment envelopes. All of them are loopable. All of them have fine-grained timing controls, so it shouldn't be too hard to whip up something that stays in sync with our LFO, right? Yeah, um, let me save us some time here for a change. If you're trying that, if you're trying to combine two or more time-based modulation sources in Zebra that are coming from different families, meaning LFOs with ADSR envelopes or ADSR with multi-segment envelopes, and expect them to stay in perfect sync, sync with one another over a longer period of time, you're going to be in for mild frustration at best and the world of pain at worst. So... If you know that your timing parameters will stay constant, then you usually can come up with a set of parameters that will keep things in sync for a while before they still inexplicably, you know, start drifting apart. But in our case, of course, we need rock solid sync that 
if needed, will also stay in sync for, I don't know, two minutes or whatever. And what makes matters even worse in our case is that, um, spoiler alert, at some point we will start adding modulation to the timing parameters of our sources. And at that point it's game over because the timing controls of these various sources or source families all work in wildly different ways. And none of them is linear. They all have different characteristics. And if you're trying to keep them in sync while also varying their timing over over time, you're going to have a bad time. <laughs> Sorry. So what that means for our case is that from here on out, whatever we will add to our layer that needs to be happening in synchronization to our random LFO, we will have to implement with LFOs and LFOs only. Because if you take two LFOs and set them to the exact same timing parameters, they will stay in perfect synchronization until the heat death of the universe. So, okay, let's say for now that we'll be using yet another LFO to modulate the volume of our oscillator. And for now, I'm going to set its default volume to zero, so that we'll need positive modulation to make it heard. And now we'll have to figure out how to coax a fairly specific envelope shape out of an LFO. And we might be thinking about something like a I don't know, saw tooth that you know has a falling ramp, because out of the standard waveforms, it's kind of the only one that has some passing resemblance to the shape that we have in mind. There's also a user mode that lets us define our own modulation shapes, but it, well, A, it kind of makes the rate knob behave very differently than, than it does in other modes, so that makes it a bit hard to, to keep it in sync. And also it just doesn't really give us the kind of resolution that would let us define something that has both a snappy attack and a smooth decay phase. So neither of those is a good solution. But thankfully there's a much better one. Because flexible as they are, these LFOs turn into you know, Swiss Army chainsaws <laughs> of modulation once we pair them up with our good friends the MMAP tables. Because remember, all the MMAP tables are doing is take the signal from any existing modulation source in Zebra and use them as a kind of position indicator that tells the table from where in the list of values that we put into it, it should read its output value. So another way to look at that is that it's giving us almost like a little tape machine that, that lets us freely position a playhead somewhere on the tape. And then if we are also moving that playhead around, just play back some section um, of, of whatever we put into that table. And that is exactly what we're going to do. Because if we're using an LFO that's giving us a rising sawtooth as the driver or as the, the input modulation source for an MMAP table, what's gonna happen is that it will start scanning our table at a constant speed from left to right in repetition from its first um, first slot to the last and just kind of play back whatever we put into that table and if what we put into that table happens to be the shape of an envelope that we need then i'm gonna try to kind of wing it here then that is exactly what we're going to get. So an MMAP table that uses a sawtooth LFO as its driver turns it into this almost infinitely flexible generator for arbitrary periodic you know, modulation shapes, whether those are custom waveforms or envelopes or just you know random values, whatever. Which is A, freaking awesome, and B, clearly not working, at least not yet, as you can tell by the fact that we clearly still can hear, you know, the, the skips from one pitch to the next. And that's because there are still a couple details that we'll have to be aware of if we want to make use of this setup. The first one is fairly straightforward. Um, although those two LFOs are now running at the exact same speed, they're still not truly in sync with one another. And that's because um, they're still both set to their default freewheeling mode, 
which makes them work like the LFOs in like a more traditional analog synth, which is to say that they are always running in the background, whether we're using them or not. Um, which means that once we trigger a note and um, make them make them heard and, and make use of them, they will be at random and undefined positions within their cycle, which often can be a good thing because it's an easy way to inject some, some timbral variation from one note to the next. But of course, our, our use case here kind of depends on them, you know, being in, in, in lockstep with one another and, and starting at the exact same point uh, in their cycles so that we can line them up. And that's an easy fix. As soon as I put their restart parameters both to gate, it means that as soon as a note is triggered, they will both be restarted at the beginning of their cycles or whatever I set their phase controls to. Okay, so now we've removed any element of chance or randomness from the timing and sync aspects of our setup. But we can still clearly hear that skip and pitch, right? Somewhere in the middle of our envelope. And if you have a look at how our MMAP tables are indicating what their input sources are doing, that might give you a hint as to why that is. Because in the time that it takes our envelope table to be scanned from left to right, our pitch table is changing pitch not once, but twice. So remember how I said that when you set an LFO to its random hold mode, it kind of acts in the same way as an LFO that gives you a square wave, just that instead of a one high and one low uh, level within a cycle, you're getting two, two random values. That's the thing. We're getting two random values in a cycle instead of one. Whereas our uh, driver, our um, Sawtooth LFO, only gives us one ramp in a cycle. So what that means for us is that the critical points where we where our pitch is skipping don't just occur in the beginning, respectively the end of our envelope, but also exactly in the middle. So no biggie, right? Just make LFO4 run at exactly twice the speed as LFO3 or LFO3 at half the speed of LFO4, right? Well, about that. <laughs> Once again, it's a little bit more complicated. The rate controls of Zebra's LFOs are not linear. They actually work in a cubic characteristic, which is a good thing in principle because it makes them span a much wider range of useful rate values. But it also means that when you have an LFO with its rate set to 100 and you want to exactly, let's say, double its speed, you will have to set the rate not to two times 100, which would be linear, but actually to the cubic root of 2 times 100, which is approximately 125.99, but only approximately. And since these knobs have limited precision, we cannot dial in the exact value, which of course means that, you know, we will lose sync over time and we cannot have that. And since I can hear you yelling at your screen, yes, you're right. There's, there's one way to reliably make an LFO run at exactly twice the rate as another, and that is to use tempo-based timescales. So if we set their rate knob to the same value and then put one to, let's say, a quarter note and one to an eighth note, then we're in business. But then they're tempo synced. And I don't want that because in this case, it would mean that um, our dings would be coming out you know, shorter and quicker on on higher on higher song tempos, and that to me that doesn't make much sense with with this kind of patch. So that's kind of a no go too. We'll go a different route here. We will leave the timing controls of these LFOs completely untouched, and we will just rethink what's happening inside our envelope table because if we know that the critical points where our um, pitch skip occurs that we will have to conceal are in the beginning and in the middle what's keeping us from putting two envelopes into this table so one here 
I, I'm, I'm winging it for now. <laughs> I'm going to come up with prettier versions of those once we got everything going as we want. But that's kind of the general idea. Something like that. And now we're getting pretty damn close, I would say. We have a much cleaner version of what we have in mind. We've successfully managed to conceal the moments where our pitch is skipping. Um, of course, now our dings are coming out at twice the rate that they did before. So maybe we can go with a lower um, default rate. As long as we make sure that the rate um, parameters of our two LFOs are always set to the exact same value, we will always stay in sync. So there's still a weirdness there, right? I don't know if you can hear that, but we still got this weird little glitch that curiously occurs after every second of our dings. And what you're hearing there is the effect of the slew limiter that is enabled by default in, in Zebra's LFOs. So slew in synthesizers generally means the maximum speed at which a signal can change. And what, what that means in practice is that when you're dealing with signals that have sharp corners to them, or in other words, um, points at which your amplitude will abruptly change, such as you know, square waves or, um, or, or sawtooth waves, then using a slew limiter on those signals will kind of round off these, these edges a little bit. So that when you're using them in modulation, your target parameter won't abruptly change, but kind of is given a, a bit of a time window to settle to its new value. And usually um, when, when you come across that, uh, that a term, it will usually refer to modulation because um, when you're dealing with audio, you would just call it a low pass filter. And once again, it makes sense in more traditional modulation scenarios because if we were using this sawtooth FO to modulate, let's say our volume directly, um, without a slew limiter in place. Um, it could happen that at the point of our sawtooth where we fall off the cliff and it, ch it changes abruptly from maximum to minimum level, um, if that happens in the middle of our audio waveform, it could give us like a nasty distortion artifact, it could give us like a little click. And putting a slew limiter on, giving us a little bit of that time window, um, gets rid of these artifacts. But... In our case, what's happening is that um, when we're using this LFO as the driver for our table, it means that once we get to the end of the table, it won't skip the playhead immediately to the beginning to restart, but it will actually, in the, in, in, in the fraction of a second, scan the table in reverse to get back to the beginning. And that, of course, is not what we want. So in other words, if you're using LFOs in that way, always turn off the slew limiter. And while I'm at it, I can also um, turn it off on our random LFO. That's more of a housekeeping thing because with this one, we have we don't hear those moments anymore where it, where it changes signal anyway, but there's just no logical reason to have it enabled on that one. And now for the first time, we are getting clean and pristine things the way that we wanted them well semi-pristine actually because these are still my weird you know kind of misshapen uh, hand-drawn things i think i'm gonna take a sec and um, remake those in a clean version using the actual drawing tools that the mf tables are given me are giving me um i'm not gonna go into much detail on these maybe that's for a future episode for now just, you know, be aware that they're there. Go with, uh, oh boy. <laughs> I think OBS is really messing with my computer's ability to draw any shapes. Okay. Uh, bend these a little bit. And that 
puts us on the home stretch. We've been tearing through our list that we've now whittled down to only two remaining items that still don't have check marks. One of those is kind of crucial though. And that of course deals with the fact that right now our things, our events are being triggered at perfectly regular intervals, like a clockwork, which makes for a you know, kind of boring output and also never allows for the kind of cool chaotic interplay between layers that we're trying to go for to, to develop. So let's try and figure out how we can inject some chaos into the timing of our engine. And the good news is that with all the work that we've been putting into coming up with a setup that is very robust in terms of its internal sync, this step has now become almost trivial because all we have to do is get a hold of a new source of randomness, a new LFO, and use that to modulate the rate parameters of our two worker LFOs over time. So this new LFO for once doesn't have to be synchronized to anything. I'm just going to put it into an absolute time scale, make it a bit slower. And um, for this LFO, I will go with the random glide mode so that we're getting uh, smooth acceleration curves between the, the target rates. And pretty much the only thing that requires some care here is that we make sure that we are modulating our two LFOs in exactly the same manner using the same uh, modulation depths so as to not break up their sync. And if I've done everything right, then I should be getting something like that, which of course is much closer to what we had in mind. So I think this just needs a little bit more tweaking to find the perfect combination of parameters, both for the default rates um, as well as the modulation depths. So what I'm trying to home in on here is is a good balance between a wide range of, of different rates that we're getting, um, but that still won't start sounding strange or 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 weird when we get into the the extreme ends of that modulation range. So I think I'm gonna go with a with an overall slower bass rate. It's it's easier to make out what exactly is happening when I'm listening to a to a single note, and I'm also getting some visual feedback from from our envelope uh, table here. Okay, so this is almost a bit too much in the extreme ends. So I'm gonna go down a little bit with the modulation depth. And whenever I do any adjustments here that I have to keep in sync between the two LFOs, I will have to re-trigger to get them back in line. Still a bit on, on the fast side. And I think something like that works pretty well. Nice. And just as a quick reminder, the reason why any of this works in the first place is that we've only been using local LFOs for our setup. And um, that means that every note that I'm playing is getting its own entirely independent set of copies of all of our LFOs. So when I'm playing um, a three note chord, it, we're actually listening to the combined effects of three entirely different pitch LFOs, each of which is coming up with uh, with a different series of pitches and three different rate control LFOs, each of which is you know pushing and pulling the rates of the of the LFOs that it's controlling in different direct in different directions, and that's what's giving us this this kind of you know, um, kind of unpredictable, chaotic and, and spread out behavior. And. Just as a quick tangent, um, you might have noticed that in the modulation menu for 
uh, LFO3, only LFOs 1 and 2 appear as selectable sources for that. And um, that explains why earlier in the episode I skipped over LFO2 and kind of earmarked it to be used for this purpose later. The thing is that when Zebra calculates a chunk of its output signal, it processes the state of its internal modulators in a fixed order. So it first calculates what LFO1 is doing, then LFO2, and so on. And if you want to modulate an aspect of one of these modulators using the signal of another, then you have to make sure that your modulation follows this processing order. So in other words, I can use LFO2 to control LFO3, but not the other way around at least as long as I'm using these direct modulation slots. For some weird reason, these or some of these limitations are a bit relaxed once we set up modulations via the matrix. Don't ask me why that is. That's kind of above my pay grade. But also in this case, why waste the precious matrix slot when we can just get our LFOs into the right order instead? Okay. Before we wrap up this item, there's one more thing that isn't quite optimal. And that is the fact that every note that I'm playing is starting on a ding initially, right? Which becomes extra annoying when I'm playing a chord because now every chord is, is launching into this annoying cluster of simultaneous dings. And um, that is caused by the fact that we've explicitly set our two worker LFOs to restart their cycles on every note, on every incoming note or on every gate signal. And that, of course, uh, places us right in front of our first envelope. And even if our new rate modulation immediately starts, you know, um, changing those those rates and, and those timing behaviors, um, that effect kind of takes half a cycle or a cycle to take hold in a way that gives us the, you know, the, the distribution in time that we want. So if we want to get rid of that behavior, one way in which we could do that would be to use our new source of randomness, LFO2, to also modulate the phases of our two um, of our two worker LFOs to make sure that they're always starting at a random point in time within our envelopes. And for that, we would have to go via the modulation matrix because the phase knobs don't come with their own uh, direct modulation slots. So let's say that I want to randomize the starting position within our first envelope or within the, the first half of our envelope table. Uh, the way I could do that is to um, set the default phase values of both LFOs to the midpoint of that, which would be 25%. Like that, so now they should always be starting somewhere in the middle of our first envelope. And then set up two new um, modulation slots in the matrix using LFO2 as the source and the phase parameters of our two worker LFOs as the destinations, and then modulating those parameters within a range of plus minus 25% or maybe a little bit less. Like that. And now... as you can hear and as you can see by the position indicator of our envelope table, um, every note that I'm playing is starting us somewhere um, at a randomized position within our first half of the table. So that gets rid of that problem. And it's worth pointing out that this is messing with the, phase, uh, with the, with the rate modulation that's already in place because this new modulation doesn't just uh, randomize the starting phase, but actually keeps changing the phase over time, um, even while the LFOs are running, which kind of comes with its own set of uh, speed up and slow down effects that are now being combined with, uh, with the rate modulation that we already have in place. If we wanted to get rid of that, we could be thinking about something like scaling this new 
uh, modulation with an envelope that uh, that kind of takes takes that effect out of the equation within you know maybe like a cycle or something but also as long as we're still happy with what's happening why bother and i think that i think that works pretty well Cool. And I also think that at this point we kind of we've kind of earned ourselves a little sneak peek of what's in store for us once we combine this with um, our base layer and also with our effects chain. The ancient art of drowning things in reverb. How can something be wrong when it feels so right? Okay, so let's put a bow on this and take care of the last remaining item on our list, which calls for each of our uh, dings coming from a different randomized position within the stereo panorama. And the only thing that makes this be gone treacherous splendor. Uh, the only thing that makes this less than trivial is the fact that we don't have any LFOs left. We've used up all our LFOs, or at least the, the, the localized LFOs. And um, if we were to come up with a new LFO to, or, or a new random LFO to control our panning, um, it would have to be a local one to make sure that once again, um, each layer is getting its own set of random data. So since we cannot do that, uh, pretty much the only thing that we can do is to reuse the one source of synchronized random data that we have, which is LFO3. And if we're using that to control our panning directly, then we are getting something like that. Which sounds like it's doing the trick. But the thing to be aware of here is that we're now using one and the same modulation signal to control two parameters at once, our pitch and our panning position, which means that we've created a correlation between those two. And in this case, that manifests as all our lower pitches landing on the left side of the, of the panorama and all our higher pitches landing on the right side, which might not bother you. It doesn't sound bad per se to me but let's go the extra mile and figure out how we can get rid of that so um an obvious and and fairly simple solution to that is to not use lfo3 directly but to redirect it through yet another mf table before we use it to control our pan and in this case the purpose of that mf table would just to uh, kind of scramble up that signal and replace any possible random value that we're getting from LFO3 with a different one that has nothing to do with the original. So what we would do is just fill up this MF table with random values, something like that, and then use LFO3 as the driver for that. And that does the trick. Now we've kind of decorrelated the two control signals that we're using to select our pitches and to control our panning. So they are almost as good as two, as two independent random generators, or at least definitely good enough for our hearing to not get suspicious about anything. Just so I don't leave it unmentioned, there's a an alternative way to solve this, which is a little bit less obvious, but in my opinion, a bit more elegant before, because it, it gets us around uh, spending our you know, last remaining MAP table on this. Because we could also instead scramble up our pitch table. So far, I've been selling the solution to getting useful pitches out of our random LFO as quantizing or rounding its signal, right? And that is right now what MF2 is doing for us, which technically means that 
um, larger values that are coming out of LFO3 will still get us larger values coming out of our MMAP, just quantized ones, right? But actually, we couldn't care less about the relationship between those two things. All we care about is that any value that we're getting out of MAP2 will be one of the four values that, that we want, right? So what if we went back to using LFO3 uh, in its unprocessed form to control our panning and then uh, restructure our MAP2, uh, switch it back to its original 128 slots, then fill those up with random values, but then modify those values shift them into the positive half and quantize them so that by the end mmap2 will still only contain those four values that we're interested in 0 25 50 75% but 128 of them and in random order so that would give us functionally the same result we would be scrambling up the original signal from lfo3 replace it with something that has no obvious correlation with it and if we then use that scramble signal to to control our pitch then we could safely use the original unprocessed signal to control our pan and get rid of that that audible coupling but it would also require you know some um, manual fiddling with the values in the table and that's not going to be fun for either you or me if we set that up now so i think in this case since i know that we can afford spending another mmap table on that task i'm going to go with this solution all right, and I think that leaves us in a pretty good spot to finally call it a wrap on our third layer. We now have something that's ticking all the boxes on our checklist, but more importantly, you know, sounds all right, at least to my ears. I know I'm biased. I, I think our dings are still a little bit on the, on the loud side, right? I think I'm going to put those to the background a little bit more. Something like that. Okay, so <laughs> in the interest of not chasing away the last two people who are still watching, hi Dave, Rebecca, I'm going to take it a bit easier on the level of detail from here. I just wanted to quickly rattle off a couple more things just to maybe give you some ideas on where we could take this patch from here if we wanted to. So um, one kind of obvious thing is that we've been so occupied with perfecting our cool modulation setup that we kind of never spent another thought on the actual sound of our layer, um, meaning like the, the timbre of our dings, which is why we're st still stuck with pure sine waves that are only getting a passing grade because, well, for one thing, we're drowning them in reverb, but also they're taking place far enough um, up in the spectrum in a region where our hearing is, is just not that picky anymore about exact timbres and overtone structures and is much more likely to take things at face value as long as it has fundamentals to latch onto. The thing is, all the mechanics that make our layer tick are, are in place now and we still you know, have a boatload of audio modules left in our toolbox. So there's nothing that keeps us from turning this, this layer into, you know, like a fully featured um, acoustically modeled realistic simulation of, of a struck metal chime, you know, complete with multiple layers and inharmonics. But would it make this patch any better? I don't know. I don't know. Because at the end of the day, this layer isn't really meant to steal the spotlight, right? It's kind of meant to be in the background and just provide a bit more texture and spaciousness and you know, movement. And I think it does that fairly well in this state. Um, one very simple thing that we could do just to add a little bit more interest to our sound would be to switch our um, FM oscillator or our, our sine wave oscillator into stereo mode, which will duplicate its voices internally, and then just add a tiny, a tiny bit of detune, which will introduce this lovely little beat frequency into our chime. It's kind of also reminiscent of, of what real chimes give you as they swing back and forth, right? It's just this, this little kind of wavering tremolo effect. But I think otherwise, it can stay where it is. 
Cool. Um, and since we're on the subject of, you know, quick and easy hacks to, to make things a bit more interesting, uh, one thing that we also can do to increase the apparent um, density and, and rhythmic complexity of our chimes is to use a delay effect. Uh, much in the same way as we've already been using one in, in the last episode on our base layer uh, in order to, to increase the apparent fullness and the, and the number of voices that are happening there. And matter of fact, we're already piping our chimes through, through that delay. It's just that those parameters we kind of tweak to be optimal for our our pad sound and i think i would be using different different parameters for our chimes so if we wanted to give our third layer its own delay we first would have to uh, isolate its output signal from our main bus and um, could easily do that by switching this lane to be sent to bus one so now we have it in our middle lane here we can just isolate that and now I could just insert a new delay here, maybe go with a multi-tap 4 thing that gives me four independent delay lines, um, turn those all into absolute time scales, and then more or less randomly you know, come up with a combination that... that works. Place those tabs in the stereo panorama. Let's try to not overdo it. So that's just adding some density and complexity to our signal. And uh, once again, that's another thing that's, that's kind of in line with the sound that we expect from coming from wind chimes on a mark tree, because as they swing back and forth, they are prone to hitting their neighbors. So often they, they give you these, these repetitions um, that, are, that get progressively quieter anyway. So that's cool. But of course, we still also want to put this through a cool reverb, right? So instead of putting bus 1 directly on the output, I would use a mix module instead to sum the outputs from our two, from our two lanes just before we hit the final reverb in our chain. And the thing about the mix module, uh, or um, specifically about the crossfader here is that when I put it to 50%, which gives us an even mix of our two inputs, um, it's also dropping the levels on those inputs by 60 dB. So it's kind of, uh, kind of taking away a lot of our level. So I think what I would do instead is put it to zero and then crank up the output volume of our new layer and then dial it in, dial it back in very carefully to level that I like. Something like that works for me. Okay, um, finally, we're still not doing a whole lot in terms of user controllable modulation, right? Of course, we have our mod wheel assignment in place that lets us control our filter. Um, we could think about doing more with that also take it into account on our other layers to push, you know, drama and intensity a little bit. On our new layer, we could use it to, let's say, increase the LFO rates to make our dings come out a little bit faster, or maybe even to, to push the feedback on our new delay line to give us a bit more density in those moments, whatever works. Um, when it comes to pad sounds in general, I also like it when they respond to aftertouch. So we could you know, think about using that to maybe bring up some you know, growly, slightly more aggressive vibrato. And finally, if this patch was headed for commercial distribution, I would also spend another hour on coming up with meaningful macro assignments that would let users control more abstract and complex aspects of the sound that are wired to multiple parameters in unison in the back end. 
but that's neither here nor there. I think for the purpose of this series, we are in a pretty good spot to call it a day here and declare our recreation of this patch to be finished. Whee! And all it took us was... Uh, let's not dwell on that. Time's an illusion, right? <coughs> he said after having obsessed over timing controls for like an hour. <laughs> oh, whatever. And that is gonna do it for this episode and for the conclusion of our somewhat epic three-parter. Phew! Thanks for sticking it out with me. I really hope that you've enjoyed the journey, that you were able to pick up some useful and interesting info along the way, maybe some inspiration for your own sounds. But mostly I'm hoping that this whole crazy idea of, hey, what happens if we go through this stuff without taking any shortcuts is resonating with you. Because for me, it's certainly been an interesting experiment. On that note, if you have feedback of any kind, questions, comments, suggestions, as always, do let me know in the comments below. Love to hear from you. That also goes in case you want to suggest a topic that you would like to see me tackle in future episodes. You can find this and all the other episodes of Jan's Peshwa Corner on treeswiftaudio.com, which is also where you can get my sound libraries that contain the patch that just kept us busy for four hours and a truckload of other cool sounds. And once again, there's a special uh, discount for cool JPC listeners like yourself that you can get when you use the offer code QUILTMASTER. You can find out about my music, my other whereabouts on janmorgenstern.com. You can follow me on all the usual social channels, your Facebooks, your Twitters, your Mastodons. And hey, if you liked this episode and the series up to this point, then I'd be super grateful if you could let the other audio nerds in your life know about it, because it can use all the word of mouth that it can get. And as for other ways to support the show, well, you know the drill, right? Like, subscribe, share, fave, Tweet, toot, tick, and talk, and I sound like an off-brand Dr. Seuss book. You're from the internet, you know what to do. And while you're doing it, I'm gonna look for something new to chew your ears off with. And hope that I'm gonna see you around for the next episode of Jan's Patchwork Corner. Until then, I'm Jan Morgenstern. Have a good one. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs>